Um, we're very happy to have um, Adam Dwyer with us, who is a um, kayaking fanatic <laughs> and canoeing. And he's been all through the, out the Finger Lakes. He's done a presentation for us before, a couple of years ago, and uh, it was really interesting. And he, he has a lot of hot spots to go to to check out for, for canoeing and kayaking. So we'll turn it over to Adam. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me back this year. Um, certainly love working with the uh, Finger Lakes Museum on uh, broadening out people's uh, scope on where to go in the Finger Lakes. There's, of course, many places to go. A um, little bit about me real quick, though. I'm, my name is Adam Dwyer. I'm a phys ed teacher uh, in Alfred Allman, and I'm really passionate about paddling. Uh, I got into the sport when I was uh, going through grad school. I was out at a, a grad school summit with a bunch of other grad assistants, and uh, we were in the Adirondacks, and I got on a sea kayak, and I just fell in love that day. And I said to myself, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to purchase a nice boat when I finish grad school. And I gifted myself that, and it just haven't looked back since. I bought several boats, uh, gone in all kinds of different waters since, and explored, uh, researched, and found great people along the way. And uh, I've really learned a lot about myself, about other people, and especially about the Premier League. So we'll dive in here and uh, check out uh, a little bit of information for you guys at home. So a little bit about the Fair Lakes region, um, you know, it's, it's kind of corridor between the 390 Geneseo uh, region and in 81 and Onondaga. So we're looking at somewhere between here and all the way to like this right here. So we got a good chunk of New York State. It kind of just sits, our fingers sitting right there, uh, are all of our awesome lakes. There are 11 Finger Lakes. Uh, they're Canisius, Hemlock, Canadice. Honeoy, Canandaigua, Cuca, Seneca, Cayuga, Skinny Atlas, Owasco, and Otisco. Uh, a couple sub lakes in there I added in there. Uh, there's Juanita Lamoca. Uh, Cayuga is another one is off the side, kind of hidden off the side here. It's kind of this extra tributary lake um, uh, melt off from the glaciers way back. And uh, the Erie Canal comes in and out of a couple of them, Seneca and Cayuga as well. So um, it's very connected to other things, not just kind of plotted on its own island in the middle of the state. So. Um, they're very interesting. There's no other lakes, I think, in the world that sit the, the way they do, like Finger Lakes, um, and the way that they were formed is especially interesting. Uh, before we talk about going where we need to go, uh, we need to think about what we're going to do to be safe to go there. Um, super important, I just advocate life jackets all the time. Uh, even if I'm paddling in something like two feet, uh, you know, there's pockets of water that you could be deeper, and also setting an example for um, people watching you, uh, maybe it's newcomers, maybe it's youth, uh, families, they're seeing you wearing that life jacket, you being comfortable, like, hey, I can probably wear that, I'll be fine, you know, he's got a whistle, he's got his life jacket on, I can do that. Um, so even though it seems like sometimes we don't always need it, I always wear it. Um, I'm very comfortable with my life jackets, I buy nice ones so that it's one and done, and I'm not trying different ones on, I'm feeling comfortable having chafing and all those things. So I want to make sure that I'm comfortable in my uh, in my PFD. There are great stores you can do that at. You can do it up the field and stream. Uh, REI is a great store to get fitted for one. Um, and of course you can find them cheaper online, but just make sure it's one that fits. Uh, that's my advice to you at home. So if you're going to spend money on a boat, make sure you spend money on yourself because this will save your life. Um, life jackets must be worn in New York State between the, month, the uh, November 1st deadline and all the way to May 1st. So. Um, if you're getting into those colder water seasons, you really got to have that and then probably some other things too, which I'll discuss later. But um, you will need a PFD and a life jacket with you at all times. Otherwise, it could be a fine in New York State. Um, you, just, again, you just need to wear those things and have them on your person, on your body between November 1st and May 1st. But after that, it's on you to determine what you want to wear, wear and be comfortable. Um, so another thing here is a bilge pump. If you do take on water, uh, you can quickly pump that out. So uh, it's just a little hand pump. You can put it behind your seat. You can put it on your deck rigging. And you can just pump that water out as you maybe take on unexpected waves or chop or whatever that is, and you won't swamp. Um, swamping leads to rescues and, you know, trouble. So uh, it's a good thing to have in your back pocket. They're relatively inexpensive. Um, another thing that prevents water coming in and keeps you warmer when it is cold is a wet skirt. So a wet skirt will go around your deck and uh, sit around your cockpit go through your body and you can cinch it tight. So that just kind of expands your, your paddling season, but also keeps you safer too in those choppier waters. It's not gonna trap you in the kayak, please, you'll be okay. Uh, it's very loose, it's very um, expandable, so it's not gonna get tangled in you, it's not a garbage bag or something like that. So 
uh, you'll be totally fine. Uh, a headlamp is, or some kind of light source is after sunset or before the sun is up. If you're gonna do some night paddling, like a full moon paddle, uh, really important to have some really dependent, dependable light sources, not just your phone. Um, the phone will not count if the DC or a sheriff comes up on you at night and you're sitting out here in Tuca Lake in the south end in Hammondsport, checking out the moon, and they're like, hey, uh, how you doing tonight? You got a light, you got a, you know, you got a life jacket, you might have all these, and you might still get a ticket if you don't have that light source, because it's just a safety element. Um, it's for you and everyone else, too. So especially important if you're on a boat or on a lake with uh, motorboats. All right, so uh, just have those with you at all times. Uh, life is good when you think ahead. So think ahead where you're going, uh, what kind of boat you should have there, um, you know, what kind of conditions are going to be, where the wind direction is coming from, what that can do to a big body of water and how it can make waves. Um, you know, the, the air to water temperature ratio, they say if it's, it all adds up to 120, you'll be okay. You don't need a life jacket, or a, not a life jacket, you'll need a wetsuit. But if it's beneath 120, the addition of the water temperature and the air temperature, you really should have some cold water gear, uh, whether that's a dry suit or a wetsuit of some kind, um, and prepare other layers as well in case you do get wet. Uh, hyperthermia is no joke, it happens very fast. Um, I believe a man and his son just recently died uh, was it was it Saratoga Lake I think that someone had just passed yeah really sad so you know let's just prevent those things and just think ahead um, you know maybe it's sunny out we're all we got spring fever it's 70 degrees but the water could still be 40 so just think about you know even though that seems safe if you're out there too long or you have to swim and you're not wearing a life jacket all that stuff's going to become a problem um, happy paddling to everyone just being safe you know so just a little bit blurb about that. Um, another thing about paddling etiquette on uh, in the Fairy Lakes, the New York State DC and the Fairy Lakes you know, Land Trust and the Fairy Lakes Museum up in um, Branchport. Uh, sort of place are really keen on educating people about the invasive species that are currently spreading throughout the Fairy Lakes. Uh, each summer there's gonna be harmful algae blooms and that's like a green blue algae that seems to stick around in lakes like Honeyoy, Canisius, um, and the south end of Cayuga. Uh, and others too, and it just pops up very randomly for why they're not always sure. It sticks around for about a month usually at the end of August, and it's very harmful to pets, to you. Uh, it gets on your skin, it gets inside your lungs. Uh, really big issue. So uh, to keep those things from going other places, and then instead of hitchhiking that to another body of water, just making sure we're cleaning, draining, and drying our boats. Um, maybe it's leaving them out in the sun, which of course is kind of uh, contradictory when you're trying to keep plastic out of the sun, but if you can just clean it off and it sits in the sun for a couple of days, it's not going to hurt it and make sure it kills off those, that bacteria that you know, lingers on and infests other places. Um, so that's not really so much an invasive thing, it's more of just something that pops up. It's just a pest of a situation that we have to deal with every summer late in the year. But another thing is the uh, invasive species like hydrilla, that's really big on Cuca Lake. Um, zebra mussels, big on Cuca Lake. Um, and then also the Eurasian milfoil, which a lot of these things, they just, they, they plant one spot and they just really expand. And if we can just be aware of what they are and clean and drain and dry our boats, those things won't be, paddlers won't be the source of the problem for that. You know, I think it's more so not to throw shade on the fishermen, but a lot of fishermen with small boats get in a lot of different places and maybe they're not thinking where they should, you know, be cleaning and getting those things, um, you know, wiped out so they're not dragging it somewhere else. Uh, just don't let hitchhikers do their thing. Uh, it's a little bit of an invasive, invasive species I'm just going to show you guys really quick a YouTube video that New York State DC put out. Let's get some sound here. Let's see. There we go. Zebra mussels, spiny water fleas, and invasive plants harm our waters. Help stop the spread of aquatic invasive species. Clean off plants, animals, and mud. Drain your boat, live well, and leave plugs out while traveling. Rinse boat, live well, and gear with hot water. Spray with high pressure or dry for at least five days. These steps are simple, and they help stop aquatic invasive species. All right. So just a little blur about that. Um, New York State puts a lot of work into um, making sure that these things don't get out of hand and affect other wildlife. So you say invasive, like, well, why? Well, it's because, you know, too much of these plants will cover the uh, ecosystem that these other native 
species need. So uh, all that becomes a problem. It's not that it's going to take over the lake and kill people. It's that it just throws off the um, natural DNA of what an ecosystem is. So let's make sure I'm back to sharing the presentation here. After that. There's a link in the bottom too for any like invasives. So. Zebra mussels, spiny water fleas, and invasive plants harm our that. waters. Help stop the spread of aquatic invasive species. Clean off plants, animals, and mud. I'll just go to the next slide and start proofing from there. There we go. All right, as mentioned uh, before, the Three Lakes was a giant just sheath of ice that was just sitting over this whole part of New York State. And it just sitting, melting, refreezing, and changing, and the weight of all that ice sitting there just made these cavities where that water eventually melted and just made these crevasses of lakes. Uh, so they say that what estimated to be happened 550 million years ago uh, for the, the Pleistocene Ice Age. Um, so really amazing when you look at a valley, even just you're coming into, into Hammondsport, you're coming in from Bath, and you look at all those hills around, all that's geologic, that's all glacial formation. And that's just saying, you know, you go to Naples area, Canandaigua, all these places are really mountainous like, you know, rapid hills. I'm just amazed of what that looked like before all this transpired, you know. So and another thing too and I was talking to um, one of the faces in the crowd here that uh, you know the more you know and think and wonder about an area the more you appreciate it. So the Finger Lakes themselves are, are very special in that way that you can get out of body of water and look around you and go, I wonder where that happened. I wonder what this looked like then. And, um, why did this land there? You know, how did it carve this? So uh, my mind just kind of wanders when I'm paddling along the shoreline a lot of times because of just how magnificent a lot of these lakes are. You'll find a favorite, but um, they're all just, they're all a lot to admire. So um, just a little short, short profile on all of them. We'll get into the nitty gritty. Uh, there are again 11 lakes. They're as long as 38 miles or as short as two miles long. Um, they can go as deep as 618 feet as a max depth, Seneca and as shallow as 30 feet, which I believe is Otisco. Um, each one offers something different. Of course, scenic views, hiking trails, state parks neighbor. A lot of these shorelines are they're close by, like Ithaca has tons of state parks around near it. Um, the waterfalls galore, the Finger Lakes are known for their waterfalls. Uh, and they all have their own culture and vibe unique to the location. You know, there's something, even if you look at Cuca Lake, you got Hamsport, Penyan, Branchport. Each one of them is a totally different place. They're their own kind of people ecosystem, I would say, you know? So, um, it, and each one of them has that north end to south end, you got Geneva up top in Seneca, and, and then the uh, south end and Watkins Glen, they're totally different places, you know, uh, different parts of the spectrum. Um, and then some places, you know, are very residential and touristy, fine, places exist, that's great. And then some places are very forever wild. And we'll get and I'll talk to those uh, places in just a minute. So let's we'll start off with Canisius. It's the most, the westernmost Finger Lake. Uh, there are a couple, there's three nice little launches on there. Um, one at the top, there's a nice little park up there. It's called um, Vital Park, and they'll have live music up at the top there sometimes on Sundays. And you can sit out there and float, and uh, a lot of people gathered around. Even last summer with COVID, it was seemed to be just hopping. People were out there uh, stringing up boats together and floating around. And at the time, the Hook and Spoon was open, and they suddenly closed. I don't know what happened to that, but um, they are closed right now for whatever management reasons. Uh, but that was a nice spot you could paddle up to. But anyways, um, there's a couple launch points up there. and There seems to be a lot of buzz going on up there in Lakeville in Canisius. And in the middle part, um, there's a small uh, pull-in launch. Uh, I don't believe it's state-run. It might be a private launch. Um, but, uh, you know, again, at any rate, you can get in the middle and mess around. But typically, as a paddler, you probably want to be on the ends of the lake. This is a pretty busy and narrow lake. A lot of boat traffic, a lot of fishing, a lot of recreating jet skis, tubing. Um, so if that's what you're into, paddle around that, that's great, but just being aware, you're probably going to be safer on the north and, north and south ends here. And the south end neighbor is a wonderful spot, um, the uh, uh, Canisius Inlet Wildlife Management Area. So there's a lot of uh, different like northern pike that sit in here, and uh, right now they're finishing their spawning season. Um, and you can drop in there and paddle if you're willing to do the work, but 
Uh, at any rate, there's a nice little channel inlet that goes just out of the lake in the south end. Very quiet, um, very low key. You get away from all that boat traffic. And what you can do is paddle out of there. There's a little launch down the south end. You can go in it, come back up, and you go over to the beach up beach comber. There might be a band there. Uh, very short paddle, maybe half a mile from here. Uh, so make a nice day of that. So you can kind of extend your day, do a little adventure. Um, you get the wild aspect, but you can also get you know, um, some entertainment and food and all that stuff. Uh, so it's really a nice little loop paddle. This is part of the channel. You can see kind of opens up to the lake. Um, it's just not as, invigor not as uh, intense as like crashing hillsides, but it's still a nice lake. It's a good way to kick it off and uh, it's a nice social paddle place. Um, yeah, so that is Canisius Lake. Uh, there's just a few different kinds of the fish, northern pike, the walleye, largemouth bass, big for that. You can see, you'll, you'll see a lot of um, osprey flying out of this back end here. A uh, really special spot to just view wildlife. Um, but unfortunately, this back end spot where I'm paddling out of late in August is where a harmful algae bloom does kind of kick in. So you want to be aware of that and you know, check, the web, check the New York State website about where those blooms are. They're very, very uh, informational and in getting that stuff up to date and uh, keeping you in the know about where you should and should not put your boat in. Um, it's just really shallow back there and it just blows in whatever bacteria makes that and it just kind of fills in there. So just be aware of that late in the summer. But from here on, you should be good. You can go there today and have a really good time. All right, so we'll move on to our next lake, Hemlock Lake. Um, this happens to be the next Red one over, it's a neighbor of uh, Canisius, and it is my favorite lake. It is forever wild, and it is just uh, the wildlife, the tranquility. There's absolutely no other boats other than the small five-horse fishing motor you might hear, maybe electric boats, um, people fishing, but mainly paddling, you know, canoeists, um, kayakers, and it's just big, steep, crashing hillside, lots of big green around you. As you can see, it really extends all the way down, I believe it's 12 miles long. Uh, there are two main launches on this lake. In the north end, uh, up towards uh, Honeyway area, Hemlock region. Um, that one, it's, it's nice. Uh, there's a concrete kind of a, well, it's not dam, but it's like a retaining wall at the top. They're doing some repairs to right now. Um, and they'll rope off a spot where you can't really paddle in to get super close to that. So you kind of turned away to go back down and towards the lake, which is fine if you want to paddle out in the big water. A lot of fishermen use this because it's kind of deeper for them to get their boats on and in and out. Um, typically, the nicer uh, paddling spot is going to be down the south end, and there's a nice little channel that runs. Uh, it's, um, it's called Springwater Creek, and that does is runs probably like about a mile and a half back, almost a to town to Springwater, and that's where you'll see a lot of eagles, you'll see a lot of uh, ducks, beavers, you could, might see a muskrat, um, you'll come up on, like at one time I had a cormorant, which is an invasive bird, but it was sitting almost on the tip of my kayak. It was amazing. Yeah, it's just sitting there looking at me like, you know, like, you know, I was here first, man, what are you doing, you know? So, um, you know, I've had all kinds of cool encounters there. Great, great fall paddle, as you would imagine. And um, unfortunately, though, like Hemlock, for whatever reason, is one candidate that seems to really fluctuate in, in uh, depth. So right now, the last I'd seen, it was a drone video of how dry that lake is. And I don't know if it's their controlling flow from the north to try to get that, more of that concrete wall built, but um, it's really low right now where you can't even launch at this point. So before going, I would just kind of you know, check with someone or the DAC or if you can do a scout drive, just not knowing you're not gonna paddle there that day, maybe go to Candice instead, but you can see what the depth is if you can get it on here because Right now, last I looked in early April, which is supposed to be a wet time of year, it was like almost bone dry in the south end. So um, be careful not to put all your eggs in that basket for the day. Um, you always will have the north end launch, and this end is just a really special, nice, quiet, tranquil place to go. Um, it is important to know that this is a reservoir for Rochester. Um, all this water flows north uh, through a series of piping all the way to the city. So there's no swimming, unfortunately, and camping laws are very strict. You know, camping along the way. I wish it were, were a wild lake where there's designated campsites along it, but there aren't. Uh, it is what that is, so I respect those rules and um, just make it a day trip. So, um, yeah, it's just a great place to you know, get away from the scene and um, you know, see a lot of passionate paddlers and people there looking for the same thing and sharing that same space. So, always leave no trace. Um, 
nothing until that launch sometimes and you just feel so compelled to pick up whatever you see because it is such a beautiful place so um, yeah it's a very special spot Hemlock Lake and next one next door is Canadice um, and what's crazy about Canadice is Hemlock's levels here the bottom depth of Canadice is about here and the surface is about there so this thing is really much like at least probably a hundred feet higher from the surface of Hemlock to the belly of Canadice, at least 100 feet difference. And then it goes up from there. So this thing is really up on a high, up high point. Uh, it might be one of the higher pointed um, finger lakes, I believe. It probably is the highest one, um, just as far as base elevation. And uh, again, it's really quiet. It's forever wild, the same thing. It's just like a mini Hemlock. And you know, it's a great spot to bring someone new. Uh, typically, pretty calm water. It can pick up some wind coming down through, uh, being at this higher elevation. But for the most part, it's protected, and uh, it's a great spot for the, the uh, what's it called? Um, uh, John, John, it can nice outfitters, John Kenny uh, down the road. He runs uh, some really nice full moon paddles, as you can see here. We're watching the sunset. Eventually, it gets dark, and the full moon there. And uh, just a really nice spot. There's no light pollution whatsoever. So there's one middle launch in the middle of the lake, uh, and then there's another one at the north end as well. So, um, and there's a couple of herd paths off the side you can just park and drop in where you feel like you can tra transfer your boat. Um, last year got a lot of attention for sure. It, you know, a lot of people are going outdoors, which is great. Uh, but this one is a special place, and it's, it's people are seeing that it's definitely a lot of bang for your buck. So going to this quiet little place and, you know, getting out for the sunset is great. Um, full moon paddles are awesome. Same rules apply here though, no swimming, uh, motor boats, nothing above 10 horsepower, no cottages, uh, it's just over a three mile perimeter. Moonlight paddles, like I said, are great. Um, boat rentals run out of Canadice Outfitters. John Kenny does an amazing job trawling the boats to you. You get in the boats, you got life jackets, paddles, and he gets you on the water for like a couple hours at a very reasonable price. It's got a really big inventory. Uh, so if you're looking at you know, bringing someone new or yourself is not sure about buying a boat, you can go there and test some pretty decent kayaks. We've got Necky Kayaks. If you don't know Necky, Necky's a very respectable brand. So he's got uh, nice stuff. He's not just putting in you something from um, Tractor Supply. He's got decent boats. Um, again, Forever Wild. And this too is part of the reservoir combination to Rochester. So that is uh, Canadice Lake. Um, that'll fluctuate in, temp in uh, depth too, but it really doesn't make a difference in your paddling because it's kind of one big kidney, so it's pretty good. It's not like a soft end and a shallow end and, and all that, so pretty dependable spot. Honeywell Lake, uh, next one over, we're going east, and uh, this has uh, some residential tendencies. It really hasn't picked up on the tourism yet. I think it's something they're pushing. They're trying to, I think, resurgent brewing or someone had bought the new... Uh, the old, maybe it's the old restaurant that was over there closed down. But at any rate, there, there's some, some um, I would say, money and uh, economy is kind of trying to push in there a little bit and, and jump on the, uh, the Finger Lakes, um, I would say, momentum towards like some, some tourism in Ashton. But it really has a lot of nice uh, surrounding areas. You know, Harriet Hollister Park is going to be up top of this hill. Lots of hiking trails. You can see the lake from the top as an overlook. Uh, really, really nice spot to, to go up there and check out the lake you're going to paddle or when you're done paddling, going up there and taking in the view. Um, but on the lake, it's uh, it's relatively somewhat shallow lake. It's probably it's about five miles of shoreline. Um, it has an outlet channel in the south end. And that's something that's like an early late season, you know, between vegetation coming in, getting thick, that you can get on. As you see here, I'm in there in November with a friend of mine. We're wetsuits and... Uh, we're paddling. There's a little bit of dusting and snow on the ground on November 11th, and there's some foliage kind of hanging on to some of those trees. So it was really an interesting paddle where two seasons were colliding, um, and we got out there pretty deep, uh, probably about a mile back down towards um, like the Harriet Hollister end, that south end. Um, and they said to see at one point the DC had some river otters in there, which was pretty cool. Uh, but you'll see a lot of other activity between eagles, and there is one giant swan on that lake in the south end. And, It'll, you can paddle up near it and it'll kind of scope you out and it might hiss at you if you get too close. Um, try to leave them be, but uh, it's definitely in there and it definitely kind of keeps its territory. It knows where you're getting within, within probably 15 feet of it. It's, it 
you definitely got your attention. Um, so, but definitely kind of a neat spot. Um, South End has a, the New York State launch. You'll probably pay $78 there unless you have the Empire Pass, which gets you into all the state parks and state launches for just the flash of the card. Um, and then the North End has one as well, kind of near Marina. So really it's just only two spots to get on that lake. Kind of tight as far as penetrating it as far as different ends. It's just two spots. But it's also not a very big lake either. So um, this is one of the shallower lakes. So maybe Otisco is maybe one up above it, but 33 feet at its deepest spot. So um, a lot of people love fishing it because they can drop a line anywhere. And uh, you know, so a lot of widespread fishermen. Uh, there is a seaplane that does fly into there as well. Someone has it docked up. So you can see that take off every now and then. It's pretty cool to do from the shoreline, <laughs> not out in the middle. Um, a lot of boat traffic, typically if, you, if you're looking at here at Hollister Park and you're looking down here, it looks like someone's like a wolverine swiping at all the water, just a lot of swirling, you know, tracks of water going on down there. So just being aware of what kind of time of day you're going down there to paddle and keeping aware of the, the jet ski boat traffic because it is kind of congested at times, especially around those holidays. So yeah, this is, Harry, this is uh, Honey Oil Lake, a uh, great spot to be. So. Uh, Canandaigua Lake. This, uh, again, is one of those multi-personality lakes. It's got wild action to it. It's got, it's north, northern towards Canandaigua Rochester region. Uh, it has, you know, I would say like more higher echelon, upper echelon kind of, uh, you know, um, dining up in the north end um, and residential kind of status. This is one of the most expensive lakes to live in the country. Um, I think it's somewhere behind Lake Tahoe. Uh, it's said to be that, yes. And you know what? Part of that is that the Finger Lakes, um, the uh, CMAC, the concert concert uh, venue, has also attracted some other superstars like King Chesney owns a, a cottage on this lake and some other folks. Um, so the taxes on this are quite high. But um, you know, so just get in there and plop in. There's a south end launch. There's a north end launch, um, and there's one launch door in the middle. I think it's like a like a state I don't know, a state park or a state launch. Um, but anyways, you can get on this in three different ways. It's, it's a 15-mile it's shoreline. Um, there are two ADA kayak launches, meaning you can get set your boat on uh, some rollers and, and uh, some railings, and you just drop in, uh, which is really uh, useful. And that's typically on the West River action on uh, the south end, and then the, also the other south end neighboring like Naples uh, has that. So you could go from kayak roller to kayak roller if you wanted to. Uh, it makes for a great paddle before all the vegetation gets in. Um, so I mentioned the West River. So the South End has this really nice winding channel that goes around this huge hill and it wraps around towards Middle Snacks. And there's a fishing access on this side. So you could go, you could park two cars or go out and back and you just get in the South End where it's really calm, not a lot of boat traffic, and you just kind of creep back down in through here and then exit out where that fishing access is. You can't miss it. Uh, or you keep going past it a little bit, it goes up for a ways, and um, if you go there in this time of year, you can still get back there. The, the uh, lily pads and other vegetation hasn't grown up too tall to get back in there. It's not too stewy, and um, you'll be able to see, you know, last year I paddled back in there, and I saw like literally like a city of like egret, or I would say kingfisher, or blue, blue herons nest up there. And uh, so literally like nest, 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 and I'm just sitting there watching them all come in and out, and it was just a really cool experience. That's deep in the West River area. Um, you're gonna have to work to get to that point a little bit, but as long as the water's up, um, you can get in and out. So, um, yeah. So the North End really doesn't have much beyond just getting in the water. It's nothing, I would say, that jumps out at you. Um, this is a juvenile eagle swooping. Uh, we're in the South End at that point, uh, about even with the sawmill, which is another great spot to go and. Uh, you can go eat there, go paddle, or paddle and eat, whatever you want to do. Um, and what's great about that south end is it collects a lot of people uh, getting in the water, and they have the stewards there working it, checking it out, looking for invasive species, educating people on you know, what that looks like. Um, I remember I was, I was there a couple years ago, and the Eurasian milfoil was sitting on the side of my boat, like, oh, found that, and they just explained to me like, what the characteristics are. There's other things like seaweed that look similar, but these things are different. So they're, they're educating the public on what to look for in, in making allies in the fight against invasives. So, and Canandaigua Lake, great spot. Uh, I'll show you a little video, if you don't mind, that we paddled the uh, Naples Creek into the West River. 
Um, this was in mid-April, and I uh, had a lot, of time, a lot of fun doing this with a couple good friends of mine. <laughs> Just outside of Naples, and this will eventually spit into it. There were a couple portages, um, some logs down and things like that, as you expect in a creek like this. But, um, you know, it's usually a fishing access, but the water's up, you can get dropped in and uh, explore for yourself a big current adventure going into the West River. Eventually, we pop out and the West River itself before everything gets thrown in. Um, a lot of duck hunting goes on down here. Um, so you'll see duck blinds and when it's in season, you can look out for that. Um, but typically by end of July, early August, this access from the south end is going to be really low and it gets like pea soupy, all green, and there are sometimes Sometimes um, there are harmful algae blooms in the south end here too to be aware of. So uh, make sure you are checking that forecast again late, late August, mid August. That's something that kind of comes in to be aware of. But as the water was up, we could kind of get in through and paddle between these trees. This is something you won't be able to do probably like the first week of July. It's going to be just totally green. Uh, it's going to be a little more shallow. We're going to receive less rain from then on. And this water is flowing away from the lake, so um, you've got to get it while it's up. You can see I'm, I'm scrolling around some stuff, and I have one paddle there, and that stuff will multiply very quickly, as long as it gets warm and stops raining and, and all that. But. So you guys get the gist. I just want to show a little, little content there. So I'm just totally blabbing the whole time here. So, all right, so here we are at Cuca Lake. Uh, it's about midway between all the lakes, halfway um, between from here to old, um, from Canisius to uh, Otisco. Uh, there's 20 miles of shoreline. As we know, it's a fork lake. It's one of the most distinct, different kind of fair lakes, or lakes for that matter, like the way it's shaped. And um, again, there are ecosystems with it and different town. Uh, themes and, and vibes it brings. So uh, again, the three towns, Hammondsport, Branchport, Penn Yen. Coldbrook in the south end here is a really nice spot that you can jump out of um, the depot launch area, uh, and, which is right here. And you'll kind of just scoop around and you go into what's called Coldbrook, and that'll go in through town underneath the bridge, back probably about a half mile or more, depending on how high the flow is. In the summer, you get on there probably a half mile. Right now, you might be able to get almost a mile if you're willing to move your boat around a little bit. Um, nice little trough back there. Uh, you'll see a lot of trout fishermen. And um, yeah, it's just a really neat little experience. You never know that that little part exists. You go into Hammondsburg, you drive over that little bridge there, you think, okay, there's a little, there's a, a trough of water there. Like, whatever, big deal. And you get paddling it, and you're like, wow, this is a really cool um, little spot for the water. So, Back there with the friends, we're about about beached right there. We had our life jackets off, just hanging out, um, relaxing, taking in. It was a mid July day. Um, it can get low back there, depending on the summer. Every summer is different, but if it does get low, then of course you won't go back there as far. But at any rate, it's always worth uh, exploration. Uh, it kind of gives you this little bio feel too when you get back in there. There's you'll see a lot of um, osprey, but when you do go through there, there's like different boat houses and stuff that have kind of been left or dead and you know it kind of has that feel like you're you know it's maybe somewhere down south or something paddling and you should expect to see the alligator somewhere but maybe it's my imagination wandering but uh the north end of Pen Yan has the outlet trail and you can paddle pretty much into Pen Yan from there there's a launch in that end uh the motorboats will be getting in through there but there's also a spot if you keep going left from that launch and getting into Pen Yan is pretty neat just so you do like kind of semi-wild experience, and then you get into the urban action of, of the, uh, the town of Penyan. So um, that's a, a neat little different experience as well, and kind of dabbling in between the two. Um, and then on the other side of that, Branchport has the Sugar Creek outlet that, or you could say inlet, um, I think it's an inlet, 
and um, you can get back there pretty far too. There's some things to get around, come down trees, but it's nothing too extreme or it's very manageable. You just kind of kind of might have to do limbo a couple times, um, but then it's really quiet back there. It's a uh, nice, um, not totally ADA launch, but definitely a floating launch for kayakers. It's just a but floating blocks uh, like a dock, and you just kind of apply your foot, your boat there, and it's very easy to get in and, and paddle out um, where there's not so much boat traffic. And at any rate, you can paddle the big lake as well. And you can run along to these shorelines. Huca Lake drops off really quick. It gets really deep very fast. Um, it's a pretty deep lake. I believe it's somewhere 150 feet deep down at the bluff, maybe a little deeper than that. Um, so it's definitely something to be respected. And it's pretty spaced out, but it can get a little busy with boat traffic. Um, but for the most part, you're pretty good as you're sticking to shore. And if you're ever crossing a big lake like this, make sure that you're with good company and you're wearing bright colors. Um, and you're using your paddles to your advantage for people to see those things. It's bright. It's important to have like a, I would say a very a vibrant color for a paddle. Black paddles and things like that really don't cut it. You've got something that's really bright blue, green, orange, yellow, whatever. Uh, gets people boaters' attention so they see you. Um, you know, people are filming themselves doing whatever it is. You're always looking for kayakers. So just be aware of that on big lakes like Cuca where lots going on recreationally wise. Um, so in the Fairlakes Museum, I've mentioned, this is the Fairlakes Boating Museum, great organization, but also the Fairlakes Museum uh, in Branchport will offer a lot of kayak programs and they, they'll guide uh, full moon paddles, strawberry moon, blueberry moon, whatever. Uh, they run a Cuco 5K race that I've participated in the last five years. Um, right out of that point, they go along the Cuco Lake State Park, their launch point as well, Empire Pass accepted, um, that you can paddle out to there. It's a 5K, come back, they have lots of great um, music, food, prizes, great people. I've met some of the most passionate people at that race that I've been in contact still today. Um, and you just learn a lot from going to certain events that they, they host because they're attracting some really special people. So if you could uh, reach out to them and, and check their Facebook or what events they have going on in the future, it will definitely enhance your boating experience. So um, they do stand up paddleboarding stuff too, canoeing, uh, birding, hiking stuff too. So. Um, definitely hit them up for all your outdoor needs, especially locally to Cuca. Um, yeah, so uh, Cuca Lake, awesome spot. Each end has its own little wild point. Um, of course, we all know the wineries and restaurants and establishments around Cuca are top notch. So you really can't go wrong with spending a day in Cuca. So uh, Juanita La Mocha Lakes. These two are not fairy lakes, but I just thought I'd just throw them in there because they're neighboring. They're kind of like a buffer zone between here and Seneca, and it's a great spot to go paddle. It's pretty quiet. Um, there, there's a nice ADA launch that sits on the connector uh, canal or kind of pathway channel between the two Juanita and Mocha lakes. Um, both are very shallow, limited in the small motorboat traffic, um, and uh, yeah, it's just uh, a neat little spot. There's Mosquito Island on, I think it's on Juanita, that there's a little rope swing there. Uh, it's not as deep as you'd wish, probably, because you don't want to do a big, huge cannonball there. It's kind of shallow, but at any rate, it's a cool place to take the family and um, kind of get them hooked or, or spend a whole day picnicking there and paddling around the island. And um, it kind of is, it's a big little adventure for anyone, really. So this is the, the little, um, this is the receding shoreline from the island there. So the island's pretty decent. Um, uh, it's just a neat little pull off, if you wish. Um, just to just kind of expand your experience or and waterways around the Fairy Lakes that are right nearby. Um, so we're over to Seneca Lake, huge lake. Uh, this is real big water. This is where I would suggest a little more experience um, and knowing your boat very well. Uh, this chop can get very, very big and Seneca Lake doesn't typically warm up very quickly. It actually stays somewhere around like high 60s, maybe low 70s at best in a real warm summer. Uh, it connects Geneva in the, the Erie Canal in the north end in the south end, there's a little canal that it drops through there where they get big boats out to that water and you can launch into the south end there. And a lot of big steep crashing shorelines, so it's very scenic along the sides. Um, and the Montezuma Wildlife uh, Management Area is right up north by it, so you could paddle uh, out of the canal from the north end up into there, kind of sample and dabble around that region. You'll probably see a lot of awesome wildlife and birds uh, and come back in and then maybe you can paddle around the north end. It's very calm up here in the north end. Um, typically, it's, it's somewhat shallow for the most part, right along the top crest, and then you know drops and caves right out. 
as you would imagine, but um, definitely a really neat lake. Uh, you got Watkins Glen in the south end, lots going on there. Uh, lots of great establishments around it. Of course, there's a racetrack action and the main street and you know all those awesome things that come with the different points at Seneca. Um, again, it's the deepest one, it's 618 feet, 38 miles long. Um, great view from it is Grist Iron, if you ever heard of Grist Iron Brewing Company. Um, come up there and you watch the sunset and you look at the lake and just how big it spans. If you see little ripples from there, those are big waves down low. So it's, it's definitely no joke. Um, if you're coming out of the south end, really be careful about big boats coming in and out of that channel where the, the jetty is. It's, um, you know, it's no joke. People are, are moving some seriously big boats in and out of there and, and they're not yielding the kayaks. So um, be smart coming in and out of there and uh, you'll have a good day. Uh, I would say around the right side, there's less cottages. Um, there's not really a lot of residential on Seneca. Like there are cottages, but it's not totally, you know, it's not plotted along the whole shoreline. So you'll find like cool places like this and the stop we paddled up to the shoreline and just hung out for a minute and um, paddled back in. Um, Fuzzy Guppies is a rental and kayak uh, outfitter at the North End in Geneva, Waterloo area. So if you're uh, looking to get some gear or try some stuff out, you can be in the canal um, in the north end. I think it's probably four miles on the canal to get into the lake from there. So it might be something to check out for yourself uh, and someone else. As you can see, you get up to the locks and all that. Um, so you kind of get the Erie Canal experience, the big lake experience. Um, the south end, I wouldn't say it's got like a wild inlet. It's, it's kind of more about the big boats and getting them in and out. But paddling's paddling, and it's a nice day, and there's lots around it. So that's Seneca Lake. And... Um, yeah, there's Sansom State Park, Geneva State Park, um, these different places you can go and check out. So, uh, Cayuga Lake, very similar characteristics to Seneca. Uh, it's 40 miles long as well. About, um, it's 430 feet deep, so not as deep, but it's definitely a huge hole in the ground. Um, huge water, the waves really can kick up, especially in this south end here where uh, I was actually, what would you call it, surfing, but I was getting, I was definitely easily getting pushed around in the south end my little play boat there and um, you know so there's 14 launch sites along this lake though so very accessible from any end um, this is gonna really like I said it's gonna be a very rapid you know, moving lake in the early mornings you might catch some, some nice glass but as the day goes on it's gonna it's gonna get me so definitely be aware of that um, this too is somewhat connected to Montezuma Wildlife uh, Refuge um, if you want to take that canal over to the other side, um, that's possible to connect that for a bigger adventure. Uh, Long Point State Park is another place you can drop in, Cayuga Inlet. Uh, so in the south end, in Ithaca, you have uh, Cayuga Inlet, drop them straight through, then you have Fall Creek, and that leads to like those, sort of the fall, those Ithaca Falls, I believe, that's way out this way. Um, so eventually they'll shallow out to not paddleable, but it's something you, two things where you can kind of explore and get off that big main water and kind of do your own thing with the uh, with a canoe or kayak. Um, a lot of boat traffic coming out of the south end, so if you're coming out of Cayuga Inlet, same thing as uh, Seneca, it's just being really vigilant about what boats are around you and where they're going, how fast they're coming in and out. Uh, again, they don't yield the kayakers, and, but this water really moving a lot across this jetty with the, with the uh, rocks and everything. Um, be extra careful on that and have your head on a swivel. Uh, otherwise, too, it's another great place, lots surrounding it, lots of hiking, lots of kayaking, uh, of course, on the lake, but, you know, you've got state parks, um, you know, Buttermilk Falls, Treeman, all that Fillmore Glen, Tucanic Falls, all that stuff's pretty local, close by for you to, uh, to extend your day to paddling in the morning, maybe, and then hiking afternoon, or vice versa. So, definitely a, a great lake, and it's just super immense. It's a big body of water. Uh, Owasco Lake, uh, we're going to downsize a lot here. So it's got three launches. Uh, those are Emerson uh, Park, the North Launch on Owasco Outlet, and Cayuga Park Launch Access in the South End. Uh, it's the sixth largest in your lake, so it's, it's not short. It's just like a lot smaller than Cayuga and Seneca. Um, 11 miles long. It is also serving as a reservoir to Syracuse, 117 feet max depth. And again, it has an inlet and outlet. I love the lakes that have an inlet and outlet. That's, saying, that's a place where I can go and escape and kind of um, go where I can just kind of have my little exploration. Um, you can paddle up not super far out of the Wasco Outlet, uh, but you can definitely get out there and kind of have your own um, experience. And that same thing goes for the south end. 
Of course, those places are going to have more water at this time of year as they are in like August or you know September. So um, now's the time to get on those those areas. And um, you know, Owasco is is very clean water as you as you imagine. I mean, they use it for a reservoir, so you can really see pretty deep and far down along the sides of the shoreline. Um, there is decent residential along this, so it's not really a lot of untouched shoreline um, as most paddlers kind of look for. But if you just love paddling, you're looking for to go down the lake. Um, I mean, nothing stopping you other than yourself, so enjoy that. There's there's still some nice views of the shoreline and the uh, hillscapes around it. So it's um, maybe a little more mellow than others. It's not like a drastic thing like uh, Cuca or Canadaqua has, but um, it's still a pretty nice lake. So, Alaska Lake. Um, you want to stop for, is there any questions anyone has or anything coming through? Or? I have a question. We can save it for later. Okay, sounds good. All right. Just want to put that in there. All right, so we're over to Skinny Atlas. And this here is one of the cleanest water. Um, anyone anyone goes here is going to say, this water is glistening. So um, it's pretty sweet that it also is a reservoir serving Syracuse area, Onondaga County. Um, and it has, this very nice land trust has protected a lot of the shoreline here. And what that does is it offers you just kind of your own unique experience. There's still, you know, there's still cottages and things. And there's recreation going on with the motorboats, which is fine. Um, and then just you also have your kind of side cut of like enjoying this shoreline to yourself and, and kind of feeling like this is kind of more of a wild experience um, in certain points and aspects. It's 16 miles long. Uh, the launch sites include Glen Haven. Glen Haven Public Dock, uh, Skinny Atlas Creek, Skinny Atlas Lake Launch, Bayard Park, Cliff Park, Mile Point, and Skinny Atlas Village Park. So there's a lot of points on this where you can get on. And um, These sites were located using the launch site app or paddling.com, which you can zoom in on place, see the points and plots. Usually it has a little bit of script, whether it's paid parking or limited parking or uh, whether it's open or not, uh, when they were accessing it. So it's kind of user interface. But that's how you find out these spots. Um, there is a very steep cliff side. I think it's, uh, I believe it's Cliff Park. I haven't paddled it yet. Um, you can't, you can only place you can access it is from the, um, from the wall, from way outside and come in. I believe like you have to paddle three miles to get up next to these cliffs. Um, and they're really, really neat. And then, uh, you know, just special in the way that the water comes or the, the land meets the water. And at one point it just kind of just drops for you to paddle along this thing. And, there's no cottages, no nothing. You can park and park your boat up on the water there, or on the shoreline, hang out, have a picnic, and, and just relax and take in the views of the day, and then paddle back and you know, create your own little spot, um, way away from everything. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a more of a, uh, you know, I would say, an intimate experience that way, if you're into that. Um, yeah, so skinny Atlas Lake, very clean. If you're paddling alongside, you really you probably see like up to ten feet or more. Of very clear water and uh, the depth of the, of the shoreline. Well, Tisco Lake. Um, I paddled this once. I paddled it in November as well. I was kind of heading back to the North Country and I'm like, I haven't paddled that lake yet. I just kind of want to drop down through and make my own creative way of going back home. Um, but it's five miles of shoreline. It has some pretty nice views as you can see. This is kind of later in the day so it was, you know, it was cloudy as well. Um, but you see some hills kind of crashing in and I just really kind of love that topography aspect of it. Um, so it's, it's, and it's kind of a locked in lake. There's really not a whole lot of inlet outlet. Um, it's kind of just plotted there. Um, so there's really not a lot of characteristics as some other lakes, but at any rate, it's still a nice little paddle. And what happens is there's this little like jetty that runs alongside here and there's a little slit. And this was to, I believe and this is all man-made. Um, and I think they were actually pulling water from one of these ends and it, it was what it was doing was preventing a lot of boat traffic and something from Because it's shallower down here stirring it up or whatever it was or disturbing something um, So they put that in man-made and there's a little bit of a slit as you can maybe see there a little bit um, As you when you pull it in and out and it separates the lake and blocks it off um, and It would be an erosion aspect too. I think that's what it was is a lot of this was getting a lot of some of the houses around here that's what it was. The houses around here were getting a lot of flack from this wind coming in, hitting. And what they did is they broke it up with this little barrier wall, and that way they could, you know, maintain some things without doing a lot of things with the shoreline. Um, so a short lake, small spot, um, pretty quiet for the most part. 
and um, there's a couple nice little launch spots uh, in the north and south end. Um, not a whole lot of characteristics, not really a resort, not a resort, but uh, not really any restaurants around right on top of it. Uh, so it's just kind of a residential, um, quick paddle spot, you know, maybe some decent fishing and uh, something different, you know, just switching it up from the other places. And it's good to get around to most of them and kind of just have a feel for the, the makeup of each one of them. It makes you really appreciate the Finger Lakes that much more. Um, and that is our last lake, but there's some apps that uh, we can totally utilize. Uh, they're always available to us for free online or websites. So go paddle with launch sites, paddling.com. Um, that's pretty much, I hate to say like it's the all trails of paddling, but it kind of is. Uh, it's just where you go and find spots online. You look at a body of water, see a plotted spot. Um, Google Earth is also great for that and scouting things, um, especially for rivers and looking for strainers. There are a couple outlets and inlets on there. I believe it was maybe Skin the Atlas that has a north end to it. But unfortunately, the water flowing in through there looks like it has like a lot of logs in the way, so would not recommend coming into it super adventurously that way. Um, but yeah, Google Earth is awesome. The footpath lap is cool. It's, it's an app where you can plot and, and plan your day out if you wanted to do an out and back or park a car here and go to there to that launch. Um, you can see how many miles that would be. Um, river data, if you do rivers, just because everyone's talking about kayaking, uh, just, just so people know that you can check the USGS gauges uh, along any kind of river in your state. Um, really, really descriptive data and up-to-date levels of flow for you to plan your day safely uh, if you're into the rivers. I know the Finger Lakes are lakes, but um, you know if you're doing something outside of that, just for you and your company, just to plan uh, more accordingly, um, that would definitely suggest river data. And the Cuca Lake app is another place where you can, you know, for Cuca, because we're talking the Cuca Lake uh, region right here, and we're in the, in the museum, um, they have a lot of interesting uh, updates on events and happenings right around here locally, whether it's um, something it, something around restaurants and other events, or if it's something that maybe has to do with paddling and maybe that's how you get a tip off of what's going on in the North End with the uh, Fairy Lakes Museum. So the Cuca Lake app is definitely another thing to have in your pocket. Um, social media, as we know, is a, or as we are using now, to get word out and, and um, just kind of make a broader audience. Um, there's a group that I help run with some people. It's called Western New York Kayaking. And what, what we do on there is we will educate people on harmful algae blooms, uh, other certain things happening in the area. If there's an event, like a full moon paddle somewhere happening, people converse and talk and meet other people through that, that website. They post their days on it if they want to. Um, I'll let people know, like, and so there's too about like the water temperature and kind of what to expect in certain places. People get real antsy and itchy when that first day that 70 degree comes in like early April and just kind of let people know like, yes, go out, but this is, this is the water temperature and what you can expect. So just, it's kind of a before you know kind of thing too. Uh, Western York Paddling does the same thing. Um, that's another great site. They're more towards Buffalo region. I would say this is like Buffalo to you know, Finger Lakes. This one's definitely strictly Buffalo for the most part. So just another group to be a part of if you want to be part of that community, if you're into that. Kayaking and canoeing all of upstate and western New York. Um, that's another similar page you could add as well. But I feel like those three kind of encompass some decent information if you're looking for stuff on social media. Uh, there's a kayak meetup group. That's another one, exactly as that. That's a group of different teachers and other folks that are enthusiastic about paddling. Meet up once a month at different locations and paddle together and meet people. So a meetup group. Um, kayaking is a very social and friendly sport. So uh, what what better to have that? Um, Freelix Land Trust is just another kind of website to follow, like on Facebook or follow on social on uh, Instagram. They're always telling you like what piece of land that they acquired, uh, other backstories about the information, and kind of deepening your root of understanding of certain parts of the Fair Lakes, uh, like that one. Um, like I learned a lot about the Skinny Atlas you know, um, section that they have there in that shoreline on the east side. Uh, what, what they did to get that and um, what it offers and you know how beautiful it was. So and I learned that through following the Fairy Lakes Land Trust and the work that they do. Fairy Lakes Museum up in Branchport. Um, again, the events that they offer, the races, uh, there are lots of volunteer activities and, and opportunities to meet people and become engaged with the uh, paddling community. An outdoor community in the region. 
Um, Go Finger Lakes is kind of like the um, outdoor, uh, I would say outdoor tourism um, kind of hub as well. They're, they're pushing out different places to go and things to do. Um, the New York State DC is going to give you a lot of great information about the uh, real happenings at certain locations and uh, other, other um, I would say, uh, causes they're getting behind to make things safer for you uh, and also, you know, of course, to beat an invasive species uh, and keep them at bay. Uh, some books. Uh, I've read both these books. Uh, Take a Paddle in Western New York and Take a Paddle in the Finger Lakes kind of combines the two. There's a little overlap there uh, with places, but I think that the, uh, Rich and Sue Freeman do a great job of explaining their adventures uh, along all the Finger Lakes in the Western New York, uh, Western New York region. Um, and I definitely certainly learned a lot from both those books. And um, they really write them really well in that it's not like a bunch of jargon and like a page and this is the place and a page and this is the place. It's, they kind of tell their own stories and um, journalism among their, their adventures in these locations. So it's kind of nice to kind of hear uh, the things through their eyes, through their mind, and what they experienced. And um, they definitely had close calls. They've met some great people. They found some really neat locations in their exploration. Uh, so again, I really highly recommend these. You can buy them on Amazon. If you just search the uh, Take a Paddle in Western New York, Take a Paddle Finger Lakes, um, you will definitely, you know, they'll pop up some, some website and be able to purchase them. Uh, definitely a nice, uh, nice read. Also available at the Finger Lakes Boating Museum. That's right, also available at the Finger Lakes Boating Museum. So get them right here. Uh, they know what's up. And they, they definitely hold some really good keys. So make sure you uh, do the reading. Um, you meet someone that's great, but I always find uh, more joy in, in finding a couple, like reading that book and then going to a couple places and being like, ah, yeah, I remember when reading about this and, and thinking about it. So that pretty much ties them together. Um, thank you for listening to me for the last... Know, 45 minute I don't know what it was <laughs> <laughs> and we went through I think it went kind of fast in my opinion but um, because there's lots to talk about you can talk for days on a certain lake or a certain thing that you've done and the adventures you've had but I guess that's up to you to make your own experiences so um, you got a whole summer ahead of you a great spring it's warm again the water's warming up so you know all those uh, that cold water paddling stuff can maybe be put away here soon and um, you can enjoy yourself with uh, the friends out on the water so thanks again for the Fairlands Boating Museum for having me again this year. Thanks for tuning in today. Um, I'm welcome to any questions you have. Um, before we do that, just be safe out there. Um, live the paddle another day. Leave no trace. And um, you know, please drain, drain, dry, and clean your boats. Um, and have a great summer. Yeah, actually, I have yeah. one quick question. So yeah. um, you were, you said, I believe it was catching glass was a phrase that you used. And I'm assuming that's when like, the water is really flat. And yeah. So, I mean, are there any other unique, like, I don't know, lingo words, I guess, that come with paddling? Um, uh, if there's a lot of river logo uh, lingo, like eddies and strainers and things. But as far as flat water goes, it just goes as chop. Um, I, I mean, I, I wrench it a lot of times when the water's low. I call it pea soup. I call it stew. I call it, you know, whenever that vegetation starts to kind of take hold of the surface and makes, you know, your boat's fine. It's just the paddle. It turns into a fork. Um, so you're kind of having a spaghetti dinner every time. There's another one you can use, a one-liner. Uh, when every time you dip in, you've got to like you're twirling and you're getting rid of the, you know, the spaghetti. Probably the Eurasian milfoil, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's why I try to keep those things out of their boats when we go to new places and we don't have as much stew. But um, I mean, that's yeah. I'd say that's pretty much the lingo. You follow around anyone, everyone's gonna have their own lingo about something. <laughs> the way they kind of put it in their own simplest terms, but. Yeah, anything else? Is that about it? Yeah. Awesome. We're good. All right, thank you everyone for tuning in, and uh, maybe we'll see you on the water. Thank you.